Hey, how you doing, Johnny? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm good, man. You got some... I'm liking, I'm liking the COVID cut. Oh, so everything's closed here in Melbourne. We're in lockdown. And uh, the other day I was like in the bathroom and I'm putting some gunk in my hair. And I'm like, I spend way too long trying to finesse the little bit of hair I got on top of my head. Right? I'm done with this. <laughs> For, Zoom, right? For Zoom, right? For Zoom. Yeah, I'm just going on the low maintenance look, man. Nice. So just shave Love it all it. off. Oscar was, Oscar was fascinated like... All the hair just falling on the bathroom floor. He's like, "Oh, he, you playing did he sign up it? for it next?" Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, my niece actually. So my niece, who's eighteen, she's got this really long, thick, curly hair, and that's kind of been part of her look and her identity for years. And she just shaved it off to raise money for charity in oh, uh, wow. in, in Adelaide. And she was mm-hmm. sharing photos on Facebook. She looks amazing, and so she kind of inspired me to do it. So oh. then my wife and Oscar took my hair and took it outside and put it in the garden for the birds to use. <laughs> 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 so that was nice. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, man. I got, actually just got my hair cut too. I didn't shave it all off, but I trimmed it up. It was getting kind of shaggy. Awesome. Uh, oh, yeah, that's what. Yeah, yeah. My wife's not, been my my wife's been my barber for the last like fifteen years, so that makes it a little bit easier to uh, keep nice. the hair trimmed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool, cool. Hey, uh, welcome to the Facebook group here. Welcome to the Agency Hour. Here we are live in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. Just let us know which country you are from in the comments, so that we can get an idea of who you are and how we can help, and uh, we can shape the conversation. And also uh, click the link near this video and give StreamYard permission for us to know who you are so we can bring your name and your face up on the live stream like Zach Stepek has. Um, Otherwise, you'll be known as anonymous Facebook user. Hey, I'm pretty excited today. Oh, first of all, we're turning this into a podcast. Woohoo! And uh, so the way that we're going to do this is I was talking to Max about this the other day, right? And we're like, how do you turn a live stream into a podcast? And so, Because it's a different format, right? It's a different experience, watching a live stream in a Facebook group and listening to a podcast, whole different experience. Like in the Facebook group, we ask for comments, we get engagement. That doesn't work on a podcast. So I said to Max, I said, I think we're, I think we're thinking about this all wrong. I think we need to think about it like it's a podcast that we happen to film and live stream into the group. So... I'm going to experiment today. I don't have the intro yet, do I? I can't do it. Forget about it. I'm going to shut up. Uh, at some point, we're going to start experimenting. We're going to actually do like dry rehearsals and tech runs live here in the group so you can see how we build a podcast from scratch. And I'm going to use my little sound pads here to bring up intros, you know, so it'll be like, a... hey, welcome to another episode of the Agency Hour podcast presented by Agency Mavericks. And then we'll, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff there and have some sponsor messages and stuff. And then we'll go into the show and bring in our guest and then we'll just suck out the audio at the end of it and we'll have a podcast. Pretty cool, huh? Love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, We have a very special guest uh, this week who I've been stalking a little bit uh, recently on the interwebs, found them, reached out, and he's very kindly agreed to come in and have a chat with us about a couple of things. Uh, Some of the topics we're going to talk about are building culture amongst your remote team and also sustainable agency growth. They are a WordPress VIP partner. I'm talking about Reactive Studios. Please welcome to the stage CEO Josh Eaton. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Did I get that right? Are you CEO or are you president or founder? What do you, what do you, Both. What do you call president, <laughs> CEO. <laughs> All three. <laughs> Depends on which uh, which form I'm filling out, but yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's me. Uh, for those that don't know, give us the too long, didn't read version. How long have you been around? What do you do? Who do you do it for? And what are you doing here? Yeah, we are a digital agency, uh, design and development, primarily focused on WordPress. Um, we you mentioned we're a WordPress VIP partner. Um, and we've been around for 10 years, uh, serving uh, mid-market and enterprise clients in uh, higher ed, media, and technology. Hmm. Higher ed. Well, um, what were you doing before you started Reactive? Uh, I, uh, st- I studied accounting. Uh, huh. <laughs> and then I, um, I went to work for Deloitte, uh, but in consulting. So uh, I actually passed the CPA exam. Uh, and then never huh. spent a day as a professional accountant. Uh, <laughs> so, 
uh, I managed to I managed to get the the bonus you get for passing the CPA exam there. They were they were very confused because they were like, "Why did you do this? You're not in the accounting <laughs> group." But uh, I managed to talk my way into that. So, uh, management nice. consulting um, and uh, working on technology that um, you know really large projects, primarily with like budgeting and forecasting. But it wasn't really exciting technology, and I always had done web work mm. on the side and. Mm -hmm. So after, you know, spending all day working on one thing, I'd go home and, you know, work on web projects and things. And it was like, maybe mm. I should make that <laughs> the stuff I really enjoy doing mm. what I do all day and then not be on the computer at night. Mm. So uh, uh, my wife and I actually left, uh, left our jobs and took a trip around the world for a year and a half. Um, oh, wow. And it was during that time that I uh, got more connected in the uh, WordPress community. Um, uh -huh. Uh, met the person who became my my business partner, and uh, yeah, joined up with Reactive and uh, been here ever since. Were, were you building websites while you were traveling the world? Uh, a few, yeah. We primarily right. took took that time off. Uh, uh -huh. So I'd say mostly building skills in terms of uh, making connections, uh -huh. uh, learning as much as I could, um, mm. and then traveling. Mm. Johnny, jump in when jump in whenever you can, dude, because you know what I'm like, man. I won't. I think we've lost your audio, Johnny. We can't. Oh, it's okay. You. Sorry, I was muted. Here we go. I was saying uh, pre-COVID, I'm assuming was all the traveling around, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. We're coming up on like the 10 year anniversary of doing that. So nice. uh, wow. next year it will have been 10 years. So definitely pre-COVID. Yeah. So uh, it's been. We love travel. So um, this past year has been pretty rough for for that, of course. I was gonna say you've been having Disneyland trip. withdrawal, right, Josh? Yes. Yes, that's true. Uh, our, our kids are like, when are we going back? And they're like, uh, maybe never. They, uh, <laughs> I think they just added like this because we live in Southern California. They just added like the the pass back you can get if you're like a mm -hmm. local, which uh, huh. you know would be great. We'd go during the week and stuff. So yeah, we're uh, we're missing that, but uh, uh, can't wait for our next trip out of the country as well. Yeah, they should just turn Disneyland into a vaccination hub, right? I mean, that's the obvious pivot there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, would have been good. I, uh, I heard talk of that, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, for those that uh, for those that are interested, reactive.co is the domain name here. It's R-E-A-K-T-I-V dot C-O. Reactive.co is where you go and check out Josh's work. Dude, you've got a client list that is like a dream list of clients that anyone starting out would be like, oh, my God, you've got Intuit, Microsoft, Harvard Business School, NBC, Universal, Atlassian, Wirecutter. I, I, I mean, I, I, get, I just have to ask, how do you land these clients? Uh, word of mouth referrals and partnerships. Uh, our VIP partnership has been really great for us, especially we've been partners with them for seven years. And mm. um, that definitely helped when we were really small, get us started getting some of these uh, larger enterprise clients. Um, and we've done really good work over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that's turned into some really great relationships that we've been able to leverage there. Uh, but yeah, I, it, it's a great client list. I'm, I'm really happy and proud of all the, all the work mm. we do and, and who we do it with. How did the VIP partnership come about? I was, I was talking to um, someone recently from Automatic who we're actually going to have on the show in the next couple of weeks as a guest. I'm not going to announce who they are. It'll be a surprise. Uh, but he was saying, you know, what is the perception of VIP, WordPress VIP from an outsider's point of view, obviously, we've got a lot of agencies here and, and you know, freelancers and smaller agencies. And the perception, I think, for a long time has been, and I, I'm hoping you can correct me on this, and I actually asked Jake uh, this from 10Up when he was on the show a couple of weeks ago, um, w you know, clarify this for me, because from the outside, it looks like, first of all, it's kind of invite only. It feels like this really exclusive club that you kind of need to be invited into. And now that you're part of the cool gang, you get to use our platform, which is, by the way, locked down and you can't use any of your favorite plugins and it's really restrictive. And so from, and by the way, we'll probably give you some leads, right? That's kind of what it looks, and I know that's a that's a crass kind of way of explaining it, but what does the relationship with WordPress at a, as a, at a VIP level actually look like? Yeah, uh, there's, a, especially among the gold uh, partners in VIP, there's a lot of collaboration there in terms of making sure that we're, we're serving our shared clients uh, correctly. Um, so some of the things you said around, you know, access to the platform and things like that, um, I don't believe you have to work with with an agency partner, but it helps. And it's definitely not as locked down as it was in the past. When we when we started uh, the partnership, uh, the platform was completely different. They have a, a new environment uh, that's uh, much less much less restrictive, um, 
and there's a lot more that you can do on it now. So I think that's really opened up um, who can who can run on the platform. Uh, many of our clients are on VIP and on many of the other managed hosts as well. Mm, okay. Um, and the lead generally comes in, those sort of leads generally come in via WordPress VIP because obviously the, those clients are looking for someone who has the skill set and the expertise to manage the project. And WordPress VIP is essentially a kind of enterprise hosting or managed hosting platform. And then they they refer the development and design work and implementation out to the VIP partners, right? Yes, exactly. Got it. Um, so uh, how well, a couple of things we were talking about pre-show is sustainable growth as an agency. Yep. And the, the, the thing that I really want to get stuck into is the people aspect. Like how do you recruit, hire, keep motivated, keep everyone moving in the right direction, build a good culture remotely. And particularly because of COVID now, I mean, we've, a lot, lot of us have already done this remotely for years before COVID, but particularly because of COVID now, this is, we have to work remotely. So before we get to the team stuff, let's maybe talk about the growth angle because money doesn't solve all problems, but it sure as hell helps hire people who can help you solve problems and then create new problems you didn't know you were going to have because you're dealing with human beings. But let's talk to us about the, um, I, I particularly want to talk about the revenue models like recurring revenue versus project versus retainers. How does that work? What's your take on it? And and what's your kind of the knowledge that you would like to pass on or that you wished people passed on to you 10 years ago before you started out? Yeah, a lot to unpack there, uh, which yeah, is good because yeah. I got a lot to say. <laughs> um, good. I would say, yeah, both those things, the sustainable agency growth and, and remote culture, uh, like you can't have one without the other. They're uh, completely intertwined. Uh, so it makes sense mm -hmm. to talk about them together. Uh, let's talk about the revenue models for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do projects in all kinds of different ways. Um, and in terms of, uh, in terms of sustainable growth in terms of, uh, uh, you know, keeping your team afloat, whether when going through hard times last year as a great example, having mm. that recurring revenue base there is really valuable. At one point mm. in our um, history, I think we were at uh, maybe 70% like uh, retainers. And so mm -hmm. we had uh, I remember one, we were in like Q4 of one year and I was like, I don't think we have to book a project for the rest of the year. I was like, we've got mm. this, we've got these retainers coming through. Um, it, that was really great. We're not there now. We've had a lot more growth in our, uh, larger project work. Um, mm -hmm. and so we, um, and just the agency has grown. So that's become a, a smaller part, but uh, it's still a, a huge part. Part of, uh, last year was a very challenging year. Like, I don't even know if I need to call that out, but uh, we still had a great year. Um, and it was thanks to our great clients and uh, partners and our great team um, that we had all these pre existing relationships. And so uh, we only had a few new clients during 2020, but um, all our existing clients helped us make it through and even grew in, in 2020 um, from a revenue perspective. So, uh, kind of the ways we structure that is um, most of our projects are our fixed bid, but we, we kind of run the gamut on how we like build the project. So we've gotten pretty good at estimating those and our project managers are really good at, uh, keeping track of scope, making sure that we're not going to go over timeline and budget. Um, and pretty much all those projects will turn into some type of going work, whether it's a, a fixed fee retainer, an hourly retainer, um, uh, or we even do buckets of hours. Sometimes those are combined. We'll do maintenance under a retainer and then mm -hmm. have like a, a bucket of hours for the next year, like 300 hours or something to like use whenever, uh, whenever needed. And the priority there is different based on, uh, if you're on a retainer, we have you forecasted in. If you're on a bucket of hours, it's something that we're having to, um, you'll have to contact us to figure out what our scheduling is. We'll schedule you in. So people who need the most priority are on those like use it or lose it every month, uh, retainers. Um, mm -hmm. so having those, uh, set up and we provide a lot of value outside of just straight development hours too, in terms of ongoing monitoring, um, mm -hmm. checking performance, accessibility, uh, it's like, and kind of treating it. Um, and so having those really helps in a year like last year when, mm -hmm. you know, it may not be such a growth year, uh, I'd say how we measure our project success um, 
the most important thing is the, the, the team happiness and the client happiness. So then it gets to like timeline and budget and things like that. So whether we're mm-hmm. measuring how the project is successful, if our team isn't happy, uh, that's going to be bad for our culture. If our team isn't happy, they're probably not going to do a great job for the client. And so, um, the way we make our client happy is by having our, our team, uh, our team be satisfied and happy on the project too. Uh, so we, we do what we can to not, not burn people out, to not, uh, overload people with too much work, make sure they have the resources they need to succeed. And, uh, part of the reason we can focus on that is because we have the fundamentals down in terms of making sure we're hitting timeline and budget because we have a great project management team, great team of engineers and designers to, uh, to keep those projects on track. I've got, I got about 8,000 questions. Right? I was going to say, I've got some questions too. <laughs> yeah, you go, Johnny. You go. Oh, I was going to say, Josh, when you're talking about the project managers and stuff, I was just curious, um, are any of them on any kind of like commission or bonus structure um, or is it just your sales team? Or I'm just kind of curious. I was, we had, I was having a conversation about this with some other agency owners earlier today. And so I was just kind of curious um, how you've approached that. Yeah, our, our project managers aren't, they don't have a, um, they're not tasked with like account management in terms of like okay. growing accounts necessarily. Um, mm-hmm. That is primarily on our sales team. Uh, for the longest time, that was just me. Uh, recently, we've hired another salesperson as well. Okay. Um, so there's no commission structure there. Uh, mm-hmm. Our project managers do, uh, they do know to look for those kind of things. So if there's any talk mm-hmm. in like a, a meeting where, um, Oh, this is something we might like to do in the future or Mm -hmm. um you know we have an event coming up or something like that all that information gets back to our sales team which then we um we'll reach out and try to figure out you know whether that means there's another phase or some other work Mm -hmm. for us to okay uh, push forward on cool how do you measure uh I, i want to come back to the revenue thing for a second i'll talk about retainers and maintenance but how do you measure the happiness of the team and the happiness of the client. Yeah, one of the ways is, um, well, let's say for clients, um, some of the things we look at are, uh, you know, are, are we hearing, what kind of feedback are we getting? So we're regularly checking in with the client to say, how's everything going? Are we meeting your expectations? And if we're not, uh, that's kind of how we measure that. We don't really use any automated tools for that. I know some people do NPS scores and things like mm-hmm. that. Uh, for the kind of work we do, everything's so custom that um, it, I've looked into those, but it hasn't uh, hasn't seemed like a fit. The, the personal email seems to get uh, get a better response for those kind of check ins. Yeah. Um, same thing with the team. We have everyone has regular one on ones with their managers. Uh, we have skip level meetings with with me for anyone who's not reporting. To me. And, we're doing a retrospective at the end of every project where we're very candid about uh, how the project went, you know, the good and the bad, what did we learn? Mm -hmm. All that, all that gets published Mm -hmm. on our like internal blog. Mm -hmm. And uh, so everyone, even people who aren't on the project can kind of get the takeaways of, you know, what learned on those projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, So those are, those are the main ways we measure client and uh, team happiness there. Do you have a framework for, uh, please excuse my lizard brain, I can't help myself. Do you have a framework for the one-on-one meetings that you have with team members? Or is it pretty loose and organic conversation or do you have like an agenda? Yeah, we, um, I would say it's fairly loose. Everyone has, we use Asana, that's our tool. Mm-hmm. And everyone has a, an Asana project with their manager and it's laid out mm-hmm. uh, laid out with their their goals, uh, any issues or and mm-hmm. proposed solutions. So. Mm-hmm. If an issue needs to go in there, it needs to have a proposed solution as well. And that's a mm. topic to discuss, uh, mm. agenda items. And then there's a, there's a place for feedback in there. So typically mm. we'll be delivering feedback, a call or something like that, and then recording it in that part of the, mm. Mm. Uh, the Asana document. But there's, uh, we have that structure, but it is pretty free form as well in terms of, mm. uh, through challenges and, and growth opportunities. Yeah. And, and, and the, the one-on-ones I'm curious, you, I mean, are you, are you not, I'm going to make an assumption that you're not talking about project work or what happened with this client or where are you at with this project that you're more talking about the development of that individual and their growth within the organization and what they might be challenged with in terms of their own personal growth. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Yes. Uh, you know, 
sometimes there's specific project things to talk about, but it's not a it's not a status update. If if a one on one sure. proceeds like a status update, it's not a one on one. So there's yeah, not yeah, really yeah. getting to the core of anything there. So yes, it, yeah. it is about uh, personal development. It is checking in, checking in on that person. Uh, make sure that they have the opportunity to give feedback on things they see. Um, as managers, we are able to give feedback on things we see um, and, you know, continually feeding back into what their annual goals are, their professional development goals and all that. Love it. Love it. Um, I, I do want to come back and talk more about team in a second, but I just want to unpack the maintenance um, and the yeah. retainer model for a second. Do you, I, I, I've kind of been advocating for a long time that maintenance in and of itself, if you're just dealing with like a small or medium business and you build a WordPress website and we launch it, that maintenance in and of itself is actually not that valuable because the client kind of expects it, right? They, I mean, Chrome updates, you don't even know that it's updated. It's just expected, right? So yeah. do, do you, I mean, do you have clients that are just on straight maintenance or is there something that you add into that maintenance contract to make it more valuable for the client so that they don't churn? Like, are you, are you talking to them about strategy or goals or just kind of walk me through that a bit? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's heavily customized for each client. So mm -hmm. some clients will have like an hourly retainer where they have requests constantly. And so we may call that a maintenance retainer because we're also updating plugins. And the big thing there is like anyone can update the plugins. It's the testing yeah. of those plugins and things that's yeah. the important part. Um, yeah. And so even if we're doing that, uh, some clients are going to have, they're on that retainer because they have a lot of requests every month. Um, mm -hmm. Other clients want to know, they, they want the peace of mind that, their site's going to be taken care of. Uh, they don't have to worry about being hacked. They don't have to worry about keeping the plugins up to date. They just want to. They just want it out of their head and to know that they have a trusted partner taking care of it. So, mm -hmm. um, in some organizations, they have someone internally that can do that, and but many don't. And so uh, that's where those kind of maintenance retainers are a really good fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is where we have uh, additional options there, where we do everything from uh, uptime monitoring. Uh, performance monitoring. We'll monitor light, Lighthouse scores on an ongoing basis uh, and kind of mm -hmm. track those so we can know, um, you know, you might for a project, check the Lighthouse score and be like, hey, look, we did such a great job. The, you know, the score is, you know, 90 something. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you a couple months of new features and maintenance. And if you're not consistently checking that, you may have implemented something, mm -hmm. not paid attention mm -hmm. to what's going on there. So continual monitoring mm -hmm. there. Same thing with accessibility. It's, uh, you can build an accessible site and then a content editor goes in there and puts in inaccessible content and, yeah. and you're out of compliance. So um, those are things that we have. We have tools to run automated scans and also we'll do manual checks. Uh, we'll also do things like uh, analytics reporting uh, and analysis. Mm -hmm. We'll look at mm -hmm. Google Analytics every month and produce a report that says, um, you know, here's here's how the bounce rate changed. Here's where mm -hmm. most of the traffic came from and kind of analyze that for our clients. Mm -hmm. And then are you, uh, and then are you kind of consulting on strategy or are you just consulting on from a technical layer? This is what we can do from a technical point of view to improve the performance of the website. But Hey, if you want to publish that blog post, that's entirely up to you. That's got nothing to do with us. We wouldn't do that, but Hey, it's your business. Where do you, yeah. where, where do you draw the line there? Yeah. Primarily tech strategy, web strategy. We don't do a lot of content strategy work or, mm -hmm. um, or just like content in general. So it is primarily mm -hmm. from a uh, from a tech perspective or mm -hmm. a process perspective uh, that will provide insight there. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, awesome, Johnny. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up and. <laughs> no, no, you're doing great. You're doing great. This this is fascinating to me because obviously this is the world I'm living in too in terms of agency stuff. So, you know, I always I always like to hear how people are structuring their their maintenance, their retainers, their projects, and kind of the value that you're pitching, you know, which it sounds like it's more on the, the customized care than it is like pressing update on the plugins, right? Definitely. Yeah. There's, uh, we just, um, I created a site for someone that doesn't have anyone to take care of that, but, uh, we put them on a specific hosting plan where they have, um, where they have automated plugin updates with like visual regression set up so that they could, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they just weren't a fit for the, for the maintenance retainer. Um, and so 
that's that's an example where like you know we want to find the right fit for the client and it just doesn't make sense for for some clients uh we'll still make sure you're set up in a way that you know you're, you're going to get what you need and it may not be customized care from us um and you know that client may come back for a, a larger project in the future um mm -hmm. uh but it's 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 not where we're saying oh if you don't take care of your, if you don't sign a retainer with us you're not going to be able to take care of your site we know that for many sites you're just clicking update. So those are the ones mm -hmm. that we're not actively going after. It's primarily the ones where, you know, uh, we're going to be working on things month in and month out. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and so the, the kind of the bucket of hours model, are there clients who don't, who aren't on a maintenance retainer because they don't need it because maybe they've got someone internally that can manage that, but they need kind of regular development work. And so they just buy a bucket of hours. Is, do you have clients in that mix? We do. We do. We like that approach for, clients who don't have that regular, maybe not even maintenance, but they know it might be seasonal. It's like they know for the year they're going to have a few big events mm -hmm. and rather than, rather than do a contract every time and go through a whole estimation and legal process, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's usually easier to do like maybe to say, hey, we know this for the year. Um, you need to let us know X number of weeks ahead of time. So we have lead time to uh, to resource people for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, those will work really well. Sometimes they're paired with a maintenance retainer. Uh, mm -hmm. our, our flat fee ones where it's just rather than hours, it's just like um, this amount per month and we take care of this bullet, mm -hmm. this bulleted list of items. And then uh, the bucket of hours outside of that. It is, mm -hmm. uh, it is a challenge from a, um, like if you're not busy, having that mix of, of retainer work, project work, uh, hourly buckets and things, isn't that big of a deal. Then when you are busy, uh, mm -hmm. those, those buckets become, uh, a kind of a strain on your, uh, mm -hmm. on your forecasting. So those you have to watch out for, uh, cause if you're, um, if you're, if you're careful or if you don't set expectations up front with clients, you can run into, into issues where, uh, like a retainer. And so that's why we have ours set up where if you want that priority, you, you've got to be the month in, month out. You lose the hours if you don't. That way we're setting that time aside. Otherwise, you know, we've got to be able to schedule you in. How do you also avoid the conversation where you say, like, here's a bucket of hours. Here's how much it is. How do you avoid the conversation where the client goes, all right, so if I divide the amount by the bucket of hours, that's your hourly rate. That's expensive. Uh, that's a great question. Um, for those buckets of hours, we uh, clients know our hourly rate. Uh, if we're doing a yeah. fixed bid project, um, we're usually not sharing an hourly rate as part of that because that's not really part of that that fixed bid. Mm. Yeah. Um, but for those buckets yeah. of hours, they uh, the client does know our hourly rate, um, yeah. and clients will say it's expensive, and we walk mm. through uh, what the value is. So mm. um, our uh, we have, have plenty of people come in and say, uh, I'm sure anyone who runs an agency is, is, has that, had that experience. It costs this much. So this is, uh, mm -hmm. so expensive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, you know, some of that comes down to making sure you're getting the right leads in and they, um, they have that expectation. Like our, our rates are, uh, are within market. Uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean people still won't come in and say they're, say mm, expensive. Of course. Um, yeah, but I guess over over the years of having those conversations, it, uh, uh, it it gets easier and easier. I know once we get to that point where it's like over hourly rate, uh, that client might not necessarily be a great fit for us uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I view our agency as bringing a lot more than just an hourly rate. So once it gets to yeah. that point, it's like, well, now we're yeah. now we're a commodity. Yeah. Sure, there's going to be plenty That's of right. people out there at a lower rate, yeah. but here's what you get when you work with us. Yeah. That's so good. Um, That's so good. Yeah. Um, what well, one one question I've got about complexity of scope of projects? Do you, if if a project comes in and you're not, like, do you ever build like a prototype or like a like a not a mock up of a design, but do you ever build like a a wireframe or like a like an interactive prototype just as a proof of concept before you actually scope out a project? Meaning before we've actually sold it. Or yeah, as like a like, first like phase. Do you, yeah, like the first phase. Yeah, correct. As a first phase. Oh, as a first phase. Um, yeah. for, we have done that. Um, 
typically our first phase is a is a discovery phase. So whether it's actually sold as like, here we're signing a contract just for discovery, or it's mm -hmm. actually just like the first stage in a in a project that we've given like a, an estimate on. Mm -hmm. um, it's not typical that we'd actually do like a full prototype, more that we'd prove out specific things that are, mm. um, that, that we know will be tricky. So if a client comes to us and there's like an integration with another system that they want to mm -hmm. do, maybe something we haven't done before. Yeah, um, yeah. We've done a lot of API integrations, but there's, you know, thousands and there's thousands. There's always that one. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> that would be something we would spend extra time on. Uh, so, you know, we may not build like a fully functioning prototype, but we'd like, okay, do we have the authentication working out with this API? Does it give us all the data we need? Uh, mm. Figuring all, all that out. So we try to we try to eliminate any of the assumptions we have from our estimate uh, or validate those assumptions uh, and then right. eliminate any of the additional questions we had. So if there's anything that isn't clear, we want to make that clear during that phase. So we'll... But but let's be well, clear, you're getting, you're getting paid for this work, right? You're getting paid to yes. validate or eliminate this assumption because this is the big, this is the, yeah. this is one of the biggest differences between where I see people who are starting out or, yeah. are, you know, trying to grow and established agencies is that the, you know, with the reputation, the credibility and the social proof that you've got with the clients that you've worked with and the quality of the leads that you're getting from WordPress, VIP and all that kind of stuff is you just wouldn't dream of like, doing discovery like this and not getting paid for it. It doesn't make any sense to you as a business owner. It also doesn't make any sense to the client at that level, right? They expect to pay. How right. do you, how do you make that transition? Because I know there are a lot of small agency owners and freelancers starting yeah. out who are like, I'll just want to prove how much I know and how much, what I can do to earn the trust of the client. So they then hire me to build the thing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I felt the same way uh, when I started out in terms of how am I going, how am I going to get someone to pay me to figure out how to do the project? It, 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 when you describe it like that, it seems like, yeah, why would someone do that? Um, but there's a lot of value in that because most, most people that are setting out to do a project uh, with us, they're not, uh, they're not a web person. They're not a mm. developer. They're not a designer. They're in marketing. They're in communications. They're in, product, uh, something like that, mm. not something that they do day in and day out. So they can say what maybe like the end solution they want is, but they don't know how to get there. And so there's a lot of value in being able to uh, help a client through that process and, and get them there. One of the things that we'll, that we'll frequently say, you know, we have deliverables as part of that discovery project, um, mm -hmm. like a, a tech scope document, a design brief, something like that. And mm -hmm. these are valuable documents on their own. So there's there's value produced during that discovery phase even if they decided not to move forward with us for the project they could take those documents take them to someone else uh correct yep that has not happened up? at this point to us so right. have you got to <laughs> that, a point where you've gone hey great we've done discovery you're a lunatic we don't want to work with you guys because you're a pain in the ass and we don't want this project but here it is ta-da bye-bye go find someone else so uh, we've had that happen on, on projects where we've had by our clients. It usually doesn't happen at the, at the end of, of discovery, though. So we haven't, we haven't so much had that exact situation, but we definitely have had uh, projects where we've, where we've had to fire clients uh, yeah. for, for similar reasons. So um, that's always a tough conversation to have, but uh, usually ends up being a, a good decision. Josh, um, when you're talking about scope and everything, you know, as I talk to agency owners, a lot of, a lot of them struggle with, um, you know, when you were talking about like keeping the projects on schedule and all that, um, doing exactly that because the client holds it up with getting them content or providing feedback that's timely and stuff. What, what, what do you guys do to kind of help with that part of the process? Mm, great question. Yeah, we, uh, that is a good question. We, um, it really comes down to communication and setting expectations mm -hmm. with clients. Um, it's not foolproof. It doesn't mean they still won't like ghost you for months and you'll wonder uh, what's going on with the project, but because that does still happen. But mm -hmm. um, uh, setting the expectation up front of what the timeline is and being super proactive on our end. So mm -hmm. we do everything we can to make sure that if there's going to be a delay in the project, if there's going to be a scope overrun, uh, it, it's not going to be us. It, it's going to be it's going to be the client. Um, whether, whether it's something they didn't consider. And that means when we're putting our estimate together, we have to include all of our assumptions. 
And so if we're saying, we think this project is going to be a uh, hundred thousand, we're saying, and we assume this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. And so then if any of those assumptions have changed, once we get into the project, um, that's the point where we can make a change order and say, Hey, you know, okay. we assumed this way, it changes our estimate by this much changes the timeline. Um, and that, and it's really easy to say that and then get into and get really excited about a project and be like, Oh, this is great. And then realize, Oh crap, we forgot to include our assumptions. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and if that happens and we didn't, you know, we may have thought something in our, in our head, but we didn't document that with the client it's on us. And so then mm -hmm. we, um, it's like, well, you know, we're, we might eat that time, uh, because we want to keep a good relationship with that client. Um, yeah. Yeah. Through the years, it's more rare and rare that that, that actually happens though. Um, mm -hmm. we, it really is about, it really is about the expectation and the communication, right? Cause if you set the expectations really well with the client and you communicate throughout the process, then you're typically not going to get off track because they know what's going on. They know what the expectations are. You're communicating, you're being proactive to get that stuff from them. And so I think, I think a lot of times it just does come down to the expectations weren't as clear as we thought they were or we didn't communicate as well as we thought we could. You know, anytime I get the email that's like, hey, what's the status of this? That means I'm not doing a good good enough job proactively communicating what the status of that is, right? Yeah, yep. Uh, we, having that kind of communication throughout the relationship and we have many really long-term relationships with clients. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, always putting your best foot, best foot forward there means that when something does happen on your side, like right now we, uh, we're missing some people on our team for personal emergencies and such. And uh, we're able to reach out to our clients and say, here's, here's the situation. Um, and because we've been proactive the whole time, the client relationship, um, our clients are, are okay with that. Uh, you know, if you yeah. don't have that, that rapport, that relationship with the client, that's going to be a very challenging conversation if you're not able to, uh, that's right. <clears throat> to fulfill that. It's, yeah. it's, it's like, it's having like enough, it's, it's having enough deposit in the bank of trust, isn't it? Like if you think about any relationship in your life, whether it's a professional relationship, whether it's a relationship with your partner, a friend, a family member, the, any, any conflict in a relationship typically comes down to where people's expectations are not aligned. Someone was expecting something they didn't receive or yeah. someone, you know, wasn't expecting something that they got. And usually that comes down to a failure of communication because, the, you know, the great – myth the great misunderstanding about communication is the fact that it's actually taken place you can have a conversation with someone in your head and, and you think that they've heard it but they haven't and so i think if you know I, I, what i've learned over the years is that consistency of behavior is the thing that builds trust if you think about it if we were friends and we were hanging out socially on a regular basis and then all of a sudden like we started hanging out and you were just like getting blind smash drunk, like a couple of weekends in a row, like really punishing yourself. I'd be like, dude, are you okay? Like what's going on, man? This is not your usual behavior. And so the yeah. inconsistency in behavior there makes me question. Whereas if you behave in a consistent fashion, I know what I'm going to get. So I'm, I'm like, I'm happy for you to babysit my kids, man, because I know you're reliable because I have that trust because you've demonstrated consistency of behavior. It's the same when managing client relationships. If your behavior is consistent and your patterns are consistent, you build up enough trust where then if you do drop the ball, they're more likely to be forgiving of you because you've got enough deposit in the, in the trust bank. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you, if you show up on time and you, communicate clearly and you deliver what you said you were going to do, you're ahead of 80% of the people out there. Right. I mean, yeah. that's the reason that there's just, there's just not that many people that do it, you know, and it's not that they don't intend to, it's just, they, they don't end up doing it. Yeah. I, when I freelanced, um, before reactive, I, uh, I ran into those same situations where, uh, exactly what, what you said, you know, say what you're going to do and then do that thing. And it's like, it's as simple yeah. as that. And yeah. I know that I fell victim to that when I was a freelancer, it can be really hectic yeah. as a freelancer mm -hmm. trying to manage, you know, yeah. your, 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 project, you doing the actual development. Uh, it yeah. can be, uh, it can be a challenge. So I, uh, I definitely give people grace on that because I remember doing the same thing when I was a freelancer. Mm. Uh, yeah. But then when you're trying to hire freelancers to work with you, you're like, yeah. what? Yeah. How come people can't do what they say? They do? Uh, nice um, pivot into, into talking about team. If you're okay, if we can, can we? Yeah. There was one thing you yeah. said about, about conflict yeah. that I wanted to, um, yeah. 
to follow up on, which was, um, it, especially starting out, uh, you might want to avoid conflict. Like, oh, the client client comes mm. in and says they have, uh, oh, we, we forgot to add this. We need to add this. And it's like, now I have to have a conversation about adding budget, adding timeline, something like that. And you're like, oh, we'll just figure it out. And then project gets late, project's mm. over budget, mm-hmm. maybe eat that cost. Um, we we kind of proactively look at that conflict. Um, there was a, a study uh, at one of like the major hotel chains where they, um, they figured their most satisfied customers would be the people who didn't have any issues, but it was actually the people who had an issue. Uh, and, and the hotel, uh, the hotel solved that issue in such a good way for them that they were, those were the most highly satisfied and the most loyal customers. Mm. And so wow. I find the same kind of thing with our projects. Like when there is an issue, something was missed, something was broken. It's how you react to that issue that really totally. makes a difference with that client. Not that, oh, it'll yeah. be free from bugs and you won't have to yeah. barely talk to us. It's the, yeah. it's really that how you react to that conflict. Yeah. Mm. And, and again, you think about the personal relationships in your life, right? The relationships yeah. that are the strongest and that would stand the test of time are those relationships that have conflict. It's like think yeah. about your spouse, right? Yeah. The, don't the tell me, don't tell me there's no conflict with the spouse, right? I don't believe that. That is bullshit. <laughs> I, I hear any couple that are like, we never fight. I'm like, there's something wrong in that relationship, right? You got to have conflict because exactly. that's just human behavior. This human, yeah. human beings want things and, and, and we will, we will fight for what it is we believe in. And there's always conflict in human relationships. It's r- how you resolve that conflict and how you heal that actually makes the relationship stronger. So uh, that makes total sense to me, that uh, that um, that study. Um, talking about team and, and like conflict and, you know, h- how do you – I want to talk about recruiting in a second and fi- finding talent, but uh, there's a couple of things here. I mean, seriously, I can sit here all week and ask questions because I'm just fascinated by this stuff. First of all, how is your role different now? to what it was when you were on the tools? Like, do you spend, does Josh Eaton spend any time on the tools doing client project work now, or are you just running the business? How's your role changed? Yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, it's changed a lot. Um, the first, um, four years I was doing kind of full-time development and also running the agency, um, which, you know, two full-time things. How does that work? Um, and, (laughs) Uh, so it's been, it's been about four years, I think, since I've actually touched a line of code for a client, um, <clears throat> which was a good change. Um, and so my primary role today, uh, is, uh, vision and strategy sales, um, and, uh, just like the general running of the agency. We have, uh, an operations manager, a principal engineer, uh, who are like on our leadership team, um, a- along with me. Um, but it, I am the sole owner and kind of the buck stops at me. So like, mm-hmm. uh, if there's an issue, if there's, you know, an emergency that bubbles up to me and I'll, I'll handle that. But I would say day to day, uh, I'm not in the, I may join some meetings, um, with clients and help with overall strategy, uh, approach, mm-hmm. things like that be more involved in, in discovery than actual like delivery of the project. Um, mm-hmm. But more and more, I'm I'm primarily on the sales side and and uh, account management, uh, internal things with the team. Mm-hmm. And what's the what's the? And I'm going to make an assumption that all your team are moving in the right direction and working on the right things at the right time, and that everything's running perfectly smooth, and that all the admin work is done, and everything's up to date, and there are pigs flying past your window, and rainbows and unicorns everywhere. So based on that assumption, how do you keep a team of people moving in the same direction and? fighting the same fight, moving towards the top of the What do you do internally, given that you're a remote team, given that what's happened over the last 18 months where our lives have been turned upside down, how have you managed to keep the morale and the culture of the team at a certain level? And, and what are some of the things you do internally to nurture that and foster that? Yeah, definitely. We, um, we've always been remote uh, uh, when we started. Um, and so... Uh, there wasn't a huge shift in terms of like how we worked uh, over the last year, unlike uh, companies that had brick and mortar offices and things like that. Uh, but mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that the last year wasn't challenging for even people who were used to re- working remotely. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of a, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, um, and so there was a lot of understanding um, 
And, you know, we, we've said communication again and again, but that's a, that's a big one. So if we come, uh, if we look at like the values of, of reactive, one of them is, is people first. It's, it's our, our very first value. And so it's that, you know, when there is something like last year, uh, you know, there, maybe there's concern over revenue, there's concern over clients, but we're really looking at people first. How can we take care of the team? How can we, uh, extend them grace so that, um, they can take care of themselves. Uh, and so that kind of guided all of our decisions over the last 18 mm -hmm. months, um, which, which really helped. Thankfully we had, uh, processes in place in terms of how to, how to work remotely already. Uh, we already had that. So that's kind of having those processes and then continually checking in on those is how we keep everyone moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Um, from a culture standpoint, um, we've had a bunch of new people start recently and a few more starting soon. Uh, we have everyone, uh, you know, one of the things that we miss from being in like offices is like, you don't get to like show up the first day and then, you know, everyone's there, you mm -hmm. meet them in person. Uh, mm -hmm. many people at our company have never met each other in person, especially if they've joined in the last year when we haven't mm -hmm. had like a, a team retreat. Um, so they, uh, one of the things we do is set up like a 15 minute check-in call with everyone on the team. Uh, mm -hmm. our team isn't, isn't, uh, isn't huge so that, you know, that doesn't take a, a year to get through. Um, but, uh, that's the thing we instituted that really helps people feel more a part of the team. It's like, there's no agenda for those. It's not, it's not talking about work. It's just like connecting personally. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's a huge difference between having someone be like a faceless, like, uh, mm -hmm. like that you talk to every day and actually like having a conversation, you know, outside of work things. And so. That's something that really helps. We, we do weekly all hands meetings. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, everyone starts a meeting talking about their weekend, talking about what uh, exciting things they did, which like doesn't seem like a big deal, but it actually really, it really helps because people are then checking in like, hey, remember that thing you did a couple weeks ago? How did that work out? And yeah. all that kind of stuff. It goes the long uh, way. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. does. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's that, some of my, I've, learned, I've learned so much about my team through those conversations about their personal life that have you know and, and again you're just more likely to go into bat for someone who you know like and trust you can't mm -hmm. build that trust unless you build some kind of affinity for the person right and you can't do that unless you get to know them so the best way is just to you know ask them about who they are as a human being what's going on in their life and and connect with them on yeah. that level yeah totally and as much as we believe in remote work and love remote work there's something to be said for getting everyone together in the same room, mm. which we couldn't do last year. We're not doing this year. Um, so I can't wait to do that again, but that's always a huge yeah. culture building activity yep. that everyone looks forward to. Uh, we yep. fly everyone Sunday. into a, to a location and uh, yeah. spend, spend the whole week there. So uh, stop it. Uh, I'm getting itchy. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I can't wait. I know. We used to come out, we used to come out to San Diego twice a year and run out live events for our customers and stuff and get all oh, the nice. team together and man, it's just killing me. I can't, I'm not able to leave the house without getting shot these days in Australia. Yeah. We're still in lockdown. So I can't wait for the travel restrictions to be lifted and get back out there. I want to ask something about values at what point in reactive, when you started reactive at what, how far into this 10 year journey did you say, Hmm, I think we need some company values. Yeah. Uh, well, this is going to be embarrassing. Uh, it was probably about five years. Um, right. it's it, not it should have been sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course been. it should have been day one <laughs> right we know that now like yeah. it should have been day one but but he, here's the thing because because i can tell you right I, so this is part of what we part of what we teach and help our agency clients with but i i feel huge resistance from agencies because they think it's all a bit woo woo i resisted mm. this stuff for years because i was like this ain't gonna help me get more clients what are you talking about values you want to sit around and play kumbaya and hold hands around the fire this is Horseshit! How's this going to actually matter to the business? Why did you, why did you go on that journey to instill values in the company? Did you get any help from any coaches or books or podcasts or consultants to help you do that? And what impact has it had having your values articulated, written down, and shared across the company? Yeah, we. Um, it, it was probably about five years. It was once we got to around ten people. That was when. Mm -hmm. um, before that. Uh, I was so heavily involved in, in everything that mm. I, I didn't necessarily need a way to like instill, like how I think things should be run 
without me actually being involved in those, uh, mm. being involved in those, you know, individual things. And so that's where I, where it starts to, once the agency starts to grow beyond, like, uh, you, you talk to every single person at the company every day. Um, mm. that is where, uh, that's where, that's where that starts to become beneficial. Cause how do you bring someone on and instill in them, you know, all that experience you have with your existing employees where they kind of learn that through osmosis, um, someone new coming in, how are they, how are they going to know what's, what's important to us? And so it, it comes down to decision-making once, once you're at the point where people are going to be making decisions. So like if mm -hmm. you're one, two people, you know, if you're the owner, you're probably making every decision that has to be made. Mm -hmm. Once it gets to the point where those decisions need to be made by other people, they need something to guide them. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And, and having those values really helps. So that way you get into a tough situation. You, you have a pandemic hit, you have, uh, a, an angry client or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, if you want to give feedback to someone who did something wrong, what do you point to? Mm -hmm. Uh, they'll say, well, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do exactly this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you can point to your value and say, one of our values is communication, do you see where the communication mm -hmm. breakdown was here? Mm. Um, you've kind of laid out that roadmap. Um, mm. and, uh, if you don't define your culture, someone else, the company is going to do it for you. Uh, mm -hmm. and you may not end up with the culture that you want. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's a critical part, especially as a remote team, uh, that you're proactive in, in building, building that culture and values are, are a big part of that. Yeah. Did you get any outside help to help you work out your values? Um, I, I do have a coach, uh, mm -hmm that I've worked with for uh, about two years now, uh, mm -hmm. meet with him just about every week. Um, mm -hmm. I had help, help from him on that. Um, I mm -hmm. definitely did some research on my own into like other companies values and mm -hmm. uh, kind of, kind of tried to do my own. I didn't do like a seminar or anything like that, but try to do my own mm -hmm. like process of like sit mm -hmm. down with a blank sheet of paper and think through mm -hmm. what's That's important good. to the agency, what's important mm -hmm. to me, all those kind of yeah. things in it. Um, it, it was, it was a challenging process. And then when I got to the end, I was like, e even some of our, our values, it seems, it seems, uh, you know, common sense. Um, yeah. but every day I, I can look at those values and refer, think of a decision I had to make that day where those mm -hmm. values came in handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, in fact, I think it's the, I think it's, so, sorry, Johnny, I, 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 I think it's the only vehicle that we, I think it's the only device that we have that allows us to make decisions as a collective rather than every decision having to go through the, the business owner or the person that started the thing. I think it's the only framework that we have to guide that decision making. Sorry, Johnny, I'll cut you off. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to say um, we've got a few questions coming in and I'd love to get to them before we run out of time here. Totally. Uh, if yeah. that's okay. Uh, James on Facebook asks, uh, when you have those project debriefs that you were talking about earlier, um, you know, like after a project, how do you action on the bad? Like if something comes out of that, that's like, man, we missed it here. How, what's kind of the, I know you had the internal blog that you mentioned, but what's kind of the, how do you action on the bad? Yeah. Uh, it's, there's definitely not a blame game, but we are mm -hmm. candid in terms of like, uh, if there was a communication breakdown, you know, mm -hmm. we have developed a culture where people usually own up to it. So th there's usually not a situation where people are like, oh yeah, this went wrong, but it definitely wasn't my fault. Uh, it's usually people are like, yeah, I dropped the ball here. Uh, and everyone else yeah, is yeah. like, oh no, you did just fine. <laughs> You're fine, we, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fine. Uh, but we say, but yeah, you did kind of drop the ball there. Uh, <laughs> that, that says something about the culture though, right? I mean, when a team member, and, and this happens on my team too, where someone just yeah. like, they just own it. They, they are, they're upfront about it. They're not trying to point the blame. I, I think that speaks volumes to you know, the team, the integrity, you know, all of that. And, and it's so important. My team's all remote as well. And so, you know, I think that's the integrity part of a remote team is even more important than when you're all in the same space, right? Because yes. we have to know we can count on each other. We have to know when each other's around, available, what's going on, who's, who's working on what, or else, you know, it would fall apart really quickly. Yeah. Um, so we, we take that, that right up from our, um, we, we actually do it in a sauna with like a, a Kanban thing and everyone adds in their feedback. We vote on it. And the, those are the ones we talk about. Um, hmm. and we, we take all those takeaways and we'll actually turn them into, uh, a sauna tasks in our internal thing. And each one gets an owner. 
So if mm -hmm. there is, if, if there's someone, um, if there's like a personnel issue and that needs to be dealt with, that's not public. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. make that a, a separate task and, and mm -hmm. talk to that person. Um, thankfully that's usually not the case. It's usually like a, it's a process breakdown or a communication breakdown or a missing expectation. Uh, and so mm -hmm. then we're making tasks and putting someone to be an owner for those. So some of the ones, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but we've had, um, it might be like, we need documentation on this. We need some way to onboard people into our project better this way, mm -hmm. or, you know, we need to do something in our client onboarding to make sure expectations are set correctly. It's usually the things, mm -hmm. things like that. that they get an owner yeah. and get assigned. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I love it. Uh, another question on Facebook, uh, Josh, how important is having a niche? How would you define your niche? Um, a really good question. Uh, you can listen to, it, so uh, the standard answer so, is- it's I hope you haven't got anything planned for the next hour and a half, Josh. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. We're I dropping know. all the hard ones at the 11th hour here. <laughs> no. Oh, I've, this is one I have filled with, uh, with a lot. Um, our niche is high-end WordPress development, uh, mm -hmm. primarily for higher ed technology and, uh, and media companies. Uh, mm -hmm. That's still pretty broad. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would love to say that we have like some like really defined uh, niche and you'll read everything that says, this is the only way your business can be successful. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But then our business has been successful and I know plenty of other agencies who aren't necessarily yeah. niched down and they can still be successful. So it's like, mm -hmm. if you find a really good niche where you can become an expert in that, go into that because you'll do really well. Um, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be losing sleep over like, oh, we're running all these projects, but I haven't defined my niche. And so mm -hmm. I'm, we're not going to be successful. So that I had to mm -hmm. tell myself that because I was losing mm -hmm. sleep over it. Like I have to be able to define this. So and I, I hope that like, okay, over 10 years, maybe we'll find a certain type of client. And those are the only the projects we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of like working on a bunch of different things. And that's, mm -hmm. that's worked really well for us. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you do. I think he, 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 a couple of things. You know what you don't do, right? You've yeah. got a list of projects that you won't take on, right? Or clients that you won't work with, right? Yep. Also, I think you have I think you do have it. So I think the word niche, as we say here in Australia, or niche, I think is way overused and I think people misunderstand it. I don't mm. think an, a niche is your target audience. You don't have to just service accountants to have a niche. Your niche is high-end WordPress development. That in itself is a niche. Right, we don't build Squarespace websites for life coaches. Yeah. We do high-end WordPress development for higher ed, education, technology, media companies. Right? Yep. You don't do. I'm making an assumption. You don't do e-commerce for people who manufacture hoodies. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I think you do have a niche. I think the challenge that we have in this eco in this kind of ecosystem, which is a bit like an echo chamber in the WordPress space, is that we all have a very similar like me. You for me, your niche is the is the pathway that you carve to help your clients go from where they are now to where they want to be, right? And this is kind of the process that we have. That is your niche. It does it. It's not your target audience. Your target audience can be broad, right? Adam yeah. Silverman, one of our clients, works with growth-minded small business owners. He's got a professional speaker, a vet, a museum, a school. Right? It's a really broad cross-section. But he basically does the same thing for those clients, and that's his niche, and WordPress is a big part of that, right? So I think – you probably do have a niche. You probably just can't see it because you're in it. I'd look at your business objectively and go, dude, compared to what these people are doing, you have a very well-defined yeah. niche, right? Yeah. I yeah. think the problem when people are starting out is they have FOMO. They don't want to say no to anything. They say yes to way too much, and yeah. that's what gets them into trouble. So even having a list of what you don't do and who you don't serve by osmosis means you then kind of do have a niche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I have a question here about WordPress VIP that's coming from our private Slack uh, team, our private Slack channel here. Um, joining Word, I just want to clarify this. Joining WordPress VIP, if you manage to get onto that platform, is not going to just open up a flood of leads automatically, right? You, you, you need to invest in that relationship and still, you know, prove your worth. And it's not just a like, well, here we are. We've got the open sign on the door now. Please just flood us with leads. Correct. Yeah. Uh, just like any partner relationship, like uh, we just talked about having a niche, you have to be able to define what kind of projects should be sent to you. So like uh, yeah. which clients are a good fit for you. So yeah. if you're struggling to define that, having a source of leads uh, isn't going to open the floodgates necessarily. Uh, so you have to be able to define that. 
and you have to build relationships with people throughout the company. So it's like, you may have a, a, a partner manager, but then there's other people at the company you need to build relationships with. So yeah. when it comes yeah. down to, there's a client issue, who can you go to, to get that resolved yeah. best? Um, so yeah. it's really that building those relationships time gets you to the point where you can, you know, it becomes a, a fruitful relationship both ways. Yeah. Right. And so, and so even though the quality of leads that might come through the WordPress VIP ecosystem are going to be better than if you weren't in that ecosystem, it's still not a tap. You just plug in and turn on and the leads flood in. It's like anything. You've got to build a relationship with the people there so that they go. And also you've got to be referable, right? Yeah. So a lead comes into the WordPress VIP. Someone at WordPress VIP has got to go, oh, hey, man, we're going to refer this one to Reactive because I know exactly what those guys do. This is perfect for them. They want yeah. a successful referral because otherwise they're going to look stupid for referring to someone who can't do the gig. So you've got to exactly. be referable, and that comes down to actually figuring out what you don't do, what you do do, and kind of starting to specialize a little bit. Yep. Yeah, mm. absolutely. I could sit here and talk about this for weeks, literally. Uh, this has been super fun. We are on the hour. I'm respectful of everyone's time. What questions should have we asked that we didn't that you wish we did? Uh, for me or for the audience? <laughs> for you. Uh, for you. <laughs> what, do you, what do you like? Oh, man, we didn't talk about this and I really wanted to. Uh, let me think. Um, I think uh, we could have talked a little bit more about growth. I think uh, there's, in some circles, growth is is a bad term. It's, oh, we don't want to grow too fast. We don't want to grow too large and other other circles, it's like growth at all costs. And so it's there's finding a balance there and mm -hmm. uh, going back to values. That's where that really, that really comes in. It's like, if we're growing too fast and not taking care of our people, that's a problem. If we're growing too slowly, are there enough opportunities for our people? Um, and so mm -hmm. that's something where uh, I, I was really happy when we were five people. I was really happy when we were 10 people. I was really happy when we were 15 people, uh, but it was really different at each at each phase and it was never like i never had a number in my head like oh we, we need to be this many people uh mm. it's it, that's part of the sustainable part it's like if i'm like oh well we have to be uh 30 people then i'm gonna go hire 30 people and then well wait now i need to work for those people now i'm bringing in projects <laughs> that's gonna make everyone happy and it's a huge mm. cycle of, of trying to figure all that out um and so mm. it's a challenge to do that sustainably and you may make decisions that cost you money or mm. uh, opportunity costs uh, in order to make sure you're taking care of your people. And that, that's what's mm. been really important uh, mm. at Reactive over the years. Well, at some point, we're going to reach out to you and you're going to get you back for part two and we can uh, d dive into, into that and unpack that more if you're up for it. Yeah, absolutely. This was a ton of fun. Awesome. Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy man and I uh, really appreciate your generosity here. I know people are getting a lot out of this and uh, we'll uh, keep an eye on the comments over the next 48 hours as the replay keeps playing out in our group. Josh Sheaton from Reactive, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I had a great time. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Josh. Awesome. Hey, Johnny, thanks for joining in, man. This is uh, this is your first agency hour, right? Uh, yes. First agency hour. Yep. I hosted Cliff, um, uh, a few weeks ago, but it was an agency hour. So this is, this is um, great. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining in. Uh, we're going to do this more. We've got a whole list of guests in our, in our pipeline that we're bringing in over the next few weeks. As I said, we are going to turn this into a podcast, which is going to be super fun. Uh, so thanks for being a part of it. Um, jo um, Johnny, what was your biggest, I'm just going to throw you on the spot here. What was your biggest takeaway from the conversation with Josh? Man, I, th this might be embarrassing, but I was actually taking notes on the stuff that he was talking about. I was like, man, that's really good. I need to put that into mind. Like, um, I loved his, uh, you know, we don't do enough one-on-ones uh, in my agency. And so mm -hmm. having having those one-on-ones just to, to talk about outside work, we do in our all team meetings, ask, you know, how's everyone weekend, what you've been up to, that personal mm -hmm. stuff. But it's like in a group format and you've got, a minute and a half, right, to say that, and so yeah. I think just having some more one-on-one -on -one check ins would be really would be really great. Um, yeah. I love the project debriefs after a big, um, you know, project launches of kind of getting everybody who was involved with that and just kind of talking through that. Um, I've got a I've got a whole screen of notes of stuff that I just thought was really great. So I'm so glad we could awesome. get Josh on. Well, yeah. I love the one-on-one check-ins that because I have I have I'm starting again to have one-on-ones with 
with the team and then I'm encouraging uh, like leadership to have one-on-ones with their team. But I love the idea. And I actually said this to Emily the other day. I'm like, why, why does like Max, for example, why does he have to have his one-on-one with me? Why can't he have a one-on-one with George, one of our developers in the Philippines? Mm-hmm. Why can't Dioza in support in the Philippines have a one-on-one with you, Johnny? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, that's the big thing I've got out of this call. Is like, I just want our team talking to each other more as mm-hmm. human beings, mm-hmm. not necessarily about work. We just catch up and say hi and really build those connections yeah. and those relationships. Yeah, and then when you're reaching out, yeah, and then when you're reaching out in Slack, you know, there's more of that's that. Right personal connection than just sort of like, well, I know who that person is and I've chatted with them a couple of times, but I don't really know much about them. Right. That's right. Yeah. And I saw this happen at our team retreat when we went to Thailand a few years ago and we had the whole team there. I saw the relationships change in seven days. It changed Mm -hmm. everything for the company. So uh, Mm -hmm. that was my biggest takeaway. And this has been super fun. Thanks man for uh, being a part of it and uh, look forward to doing this again all soon. Thanks Troy. Thanks for having me. Take care gang.